Good afternoon. For our second plenary session, we are going to welcome Ms. Catalina Pereira Hernandez. Catalina Pereira Hernandez is a professor at Universidad Técnica Nacional and at UNED. Since 2011, she has been the vice chancellor of the teaching at teaching major at UTN and has worked as a tutor at UNED since 2009. She has a BA in English from Universidad de Costa Rica, a degree in translation, a master's in human resources from Universidad Latinoamericana de Ciencia y Tecnología, and a PhD in education from Universidad de La Salle. Her research interests revolve around technical education, curriculum innovation, ESL, EFL culture, and linguistics. Professor Pereira has lectured and published on intercultural communication and linguistics. She has long taught workshops on technical education and innovative approaches in national and international events. Ms. Pereira holds a graduate specialization in academic management and leadership granted by the Management and Leadership Institute of the Inter-American Organization of Higher Education and has been recognized for her leading role in the academic field. Let us welcome Ms. Pereira. Thank you, Margot. Good afternoon. Having, thank you. Having the challenge of closing an activity like this, in which you have interacted with so many young people and wonderful teachers, is really a challenge, especially after all those lies that Margot has just told about me, okay? But the other problem is that when we have to start something like a closing presentation, and the first thing that you see is a mistake in the presentation you want to faint. Okay? Who sees the mistake in the title of the presentation? Everybody? Everybody saw it? Okay. And I couldn't change it because it was designed in Canva. Okay? So, it's designing, but I couldn't see it. And I hadn't seen it until these people over here told me uh, a couple of minutes ago. Okay? Uh, as we say in Espanol, do you remember the saying, the old saying? Thank you very much. Okay? Very good. Okay, I'll do my best not to be so boring. And if I don't really get my goal of not being boring, please remember the three theological virtues. Okay? If I am too boring, then have the faith, keep the faith, that I will not be two minutes ahead. And if two minutes ahead, I'm still boring, and you're still bored, then please have hope. And if by the end of the talk, I'm still boring, remember that charity is about mercy. Okay? <laughs> Don't forget that. Okay, this afternoon, we're going to talk about TBL. And we're going to make some activities. Okay? The first one is, we, I want you to build or to create a, a word cloud. I was going to say word map again. Second. With me. Can you take out your cell phones? You know what a, a word cloud is? Okay. This is going to be kind of a diagnostics. You're going to get into that uh, link over there. Please write it over there. And you're going to get into a page where they ask you your name. Well, not the full name. You can write any short name. Just identify yourselves. OK, Maria, Liliana, Rebecca, Julie, Christine. OK? Are you ready? paulev.com slash capereraerna 092. Q. 
Can you make it bigger? The link? No. It's P O L L capital E V dot com slash Ka Perera Erna O nine two. Exactly. You just write your short name, whatever name you want to write over there, and then next. O the zero nine two. That's a way of saying it, yes. 092. Remember that we call zeros O sometimes. Are you ready? Not yet? Okay, once you get in, did you get in? Once you get in, you're going to write the word that you believe is most related to the topic we are going to develop today. Remember the topic? Task-based learning. And if you know it, it's okay, you just write a, a word. And if you don't know it, write a word that resembles you of the topic or that sounds familiar. Not everybody has written. You write the word. Aha, uh -huh, you write the word there. You don't have to download the app. You just get into the link and put in the word. You don't have to write, uh, create a user because if you create a user, you start your own presentation in your own survey. Okay. Everybody still having problems? No. Okay. You're writing that the main word is task and then we have learn meaningful doing tasks activity projects activities okay so far that's our diagnostics can you take a picture of it and keep it in your mind 
mental picture. I'm not being very literal, okay? Let's go to the presentation again. Now, we're going to do another activity to see if you know what I'm going to be talking about. I'm going to ask you a set of questions, and if you really know the answer of the question, you stand up. I have no pointer, no passer. Okay? You stand up if you know the answer to the question that I'm going to ask, and you can explain it. I'm not going to pass the microphone, not to everyone, okay? So don't be afraid of standing up. If you don't know, you stay seated, okay? You sit down. And if you know something, if you know about it, you squat, okay? It's 4 p.m. I mean, I want you to be awake, okay? So first question, just the first one. What is task-based learning? Excellent. We have experts and squatters. Okay, very good. Second question. Second question. Which or what is the task-based learning cycle? Only experts? Very good. No squatters this time. Let's continue. Next question. What is the difference between a traditional teaching approach and an action-oriented approach? Come on, come on. Traditional teaching versus action-oriented teaching. Learning. Okay. Very good. Next question. What is a schema activation? You're experts. You should come here, Yang, and do the talk. Okay? And the next one, I believe that's... What is a competence? Not a competition, a competence. Okay, what is a competence? Okay, excellent. Excellent. Let's continue. Do you know the difference between a competence and an objective? Once again, Jose Fabian, you should stand, stand here next to me. And Jonathan, by the way. And then, I don't know your name. Okay, Andrea, you should be here. Okay? Very good. We're pretty much, we're going to go very quickly over these topics today. Okay? And at the end, we're going to construct, so in case you want to try to get into the poll again, we're going to construct the cloud word again, the word cloud again. Okay? Good. Because the objective of today's presentation is to highlight the main characteristics and advantages of task-based learning for you to create your classes. Okay? And to design creatively. That's the main objective of this presentation. What is a task? And what is the difference between a task and an activity and an exercise? Can somebody tell me what the difference between a task and an exercise is? No? Okay, according to Nonon, a task is basically something that, back, that has to be accomplished with a, with a specific communication purpose. Okay? So it says that a task is a piece of classroom work that involves learn, learners in comprehending, manipulating, producing, or interacting in the target language with their attention focused not on form, but on real life situations, which is function. Okay? On function. And the difference between a task and an exercise and a repetition and drills and all those things that we are used to having in our, class, in our classes or in traditional classes, 
people do it and perform those activities or those exercises just thinking about what they are expected to do. They don't act or perform naturally, okay? So when you ask a student pretty much what the first presenter this morning told us, remember? Uh, you repeat and repeat, but then when you face a real situation, you just freeze and you don't know what to do. That's the difference between an exercise and a typical activity and um, a task, okay? So TBL, in TBL, tasks are activities, according to Janet Will uh, Jane Willis, where the target language, as Nanan said, is used by the learner for a communicative purpose. So there always has to be a goal, a purpose, a communication problem that needs to be solved. Whenever you plan a class based on TBL, you need to keep in your mind that there is a communication problem that needs to be solved, a communication act that needs to be achieved, and you cannot forget that. Okay? And what types of things can be tasks? A reading? A video? A puzzle? What do you think? Anything. Anything can be used from TBL. Because if you have a filling in the blanks exercise and you turn it into a TBL exercise, then you are not just going to ask your students to fill in the gaps. You're going to ask something further, a purpose, a communication purpose. Okay, so anything can become a task, but you need to be creative, thoughtful, and very world-connected, because that's the key of TBL. Putting or bringing abstract teaching to world application, okay? And the consciousness of the students when they are performing tasks or exercises, just like we had this morning. You didn't know, you, you were not focusing, we were not focusing on learning uh, historical events. We were not focused on that, really. But when did World War II start? It? Do you remember? Start, I'm sorry. Do you remember? When was the bomb dropped in Hiroshima? You learned. We did learn. And we were not focusing on the historical event. Okay? We were not focusing on that. And we were not focusing on the timeline. And we were not focusing on the right grammar that we were using or not. Okay? We were just focusing on the meaning, on the purpose, and on solving a communication act and performing a specific task, the task that we were asked to perform. Okay? So, producing a video, um, giving a speech, making a panel discussion, okay? All those things can become tasks. Because a task should have the following characteristics or musts. Provide students with opportunities to know how much they know and to expand their knowledge, okay? But especially to exchange that knowledge and to interact with other people using the knowledge that they have and the knowledge that they are about to acquire without knowing or focusing on what they know. Okay? Let's continue. A task should help, as I said, to solve a communication problem because it is mainly a communication act. It must have a clear purpose. For example, imagine that I tell you, okay, talk to your um, buddy, uh, to your shoulder buddy about your grandparents. Is that a task? Why is it not a task? There is communication. You're going to tell each other what your grandparents do and how they are and what age they are on, <laughs> okay, and all those things and likes, because there is no purpose. If there is no purpose and no communication problem to be solved, it is not a task. It is just an exercise, okay? That's the difference. Very good. And it must result in an outcome that can be shared with more people. 
If it cannot be shared, it wasn't a task. If it does not mean or imply interaction during any one of the stages of the cycle that we're going to see a little bit later, it is not a task. And it has to relate to real world activities. That is why if you're teaching English to people in San Jose, you shouldn't be using the same materials as if you're teaching students in a rural area, in an indigenous area, where the texts that you're using have no meaning to them. Okay? Is it clear? Did I make myself clear? Thank you. Okay. So task-based learning are opportunities for meaning, providing many meaning for learning. Exactly. Very good. And to focus on language use and not language form. Okay? Very good. So TBL is a communicative approach and it's an action-oriented approach. Why do you believe, uh, what, why do you think that is uh, uh, the question that I posted at the very first slide, what is the difference between traditional teaching and an action-oriented approach was posted there? I already explained what a task is and what TBL is. And it says that TBL is a communicative approach that it's action-oriented. What does that mean? What do you think that that's, that, that means? Exactly. Very good. It is centered in the student's performance, in the student's needs, in the student's interests, and in the student's actions. So, everything that you plan and perform and, and direct or instruct should focus on students' interests. Okay? So, if you say, okay, I want students to do this and this, what for? That's the question that you always need to ask to yourself. What for? What's the purpose of this? How is this, how does this have sense? Okay? How is this uh, meaningful in their lives? And if it's not, don't do it. Because they're, not, they're just going to accomplish the activity and the exercise, but not the, not the task. They are not going to learn. Okay? It increases, then, the learner activity, that is why it is action-oriented. And it brings, as I said before, teaching from abstract to concrete. From that world over there that we don't know, that we don't understand, and we are not related to or familiar with, to our everyday situations. Like asking for an address. Okay? Asking for an address if you get lost. Is that a task? There is a communication problem to be solved. You're lost. You have to do something. So go ask for an address, okay? But then what happens if you uh, place the students as if they were in Madrid and not in San Jose? If, you're, if you want to teach, if you want them to learn how to ask for addresses in Costa Rica, how to ask for directions, then use a Costa Rican context. And then you, after that, you move further, okay? You move further. But the first thing is real life and their reality, okay? So, it gives the student a different form of understanding language as a tool, okay? Of a specific goal. So they won't feel bored in your classes again, because now they really know why they are learning how to speak English or how to write in English. Not just because they want to get a job and because it's a requirement to get a job. They know that what they want to communicate, that what they want to do, that what they are trying to achieve is because they know how to do it in English. Okay? And it's, and it's necessary to accomplish a task. And it's just not just um, a subject matter or another subject in, in, in the school. It gets the learner to use the skills at the current level, and that is very important. And it serves you and it helps you diagnose your students, diagnose your students. Because if you ask them to perform a task, and this is the first English class, what do you think that they will do? They don't know what to do. 
So you have to plan it very carefully, okay? And it departs from the student's real knowledge. That's the point of departure, okay? The point of, the, of departure of TBL is not the knowledge that you want them to reach, is the knowledge that they already have. And from that point, you go further by analyzing, reflection, and all those things that we're, you're going to see later on, okay? And it allows, of course, as I said before, more meaningful communication. And there's another thing. If you teach or if you provide students with a TBL environment in class, evaluation definitely, definitely, it is a must, needs to change, okay? because it allows you to think about evaluating students from a different perspective based on task performance criteria and not based on how many verbs they conjugated wrong or not, okay? And here is what, I don't know your name, but you said it before, the roles. The roles change because when we talk about traditional teaching and action-oriented learning, it's completely different. The teacher is no longer the person with the knowledge. It's the person providing opportunities for the students to acquire the knowledge. Okay? The teacher is no longer the, the person that opens the brain and the head and deposits knowledge over there is the person that acknowledges the knowledge that the student has and wants to propitiate opportunities for that student to go further okay so the teacher basically becomes a designer a person that prepares activities a monitor and here's the word that I was telling you about remember a what a coach I was telling them that this morning when I was checking my presentation, it said couch instead of coach, and I almost fainted. Okay. And the students, and the students' role is completely different. We don't want students to be sitting down all the class. We don't want students to be just receiving the information as you are now. We want students participating, acting, performing, looking for things. Students are active participants. They are self-monitors because self-regulation is a must in action-oriented approaches. And that is the most important and hardest challenge for teachers. Because we are used to the fact, we are used to the fact that we are the ones evaluating. We are the ones measuring. We are the ones telling you how much you have advanced or not. In an action-oriented approach, we need to create opportunities for students to regulate their advancement. And that's the biggest challenge, in my opinion. Okay? Okay. Now, what is the structure of the TBL approach? It's very simple. Schema activation, a pre-task, that is not just a pre-task, it's a stage, okay? The stage of pre-task, the task cycle, and then the post-task. Remember what we did with the words this morning? Without knowing exactly what was the presenter's uh, objective, that's a schema activation. He put on the wall, well, on the screen, several words related to the bomb, the atomic bomb, right? And he didn't know if we had knowledge or not about that. He activated, activated our learning mode. That's a schema activation, okay? It's not just an activity. It's something that activates your learning mode. That's schema. Let's continue. It can be a reading, text, a set of words, anything, as I just told you. It depends on the way that you use it. Because it activates the previous knowledge, and it is obviously related to the content of the class. 
and it prepares, as I told you, the brain for learning. It activates your learning mode. Let's continue. Then we have the pre-tasks. There is a difference between a pre-task and a warm-up. What do you think that is the difference between a pre-task and a warm-up? I'm sorry, this is not a show, but I needed to take my jacket off. Okay? What, is the di what do you think? Somebody can tell me what the difference between a warm-up and a pre-task is? Should be, should be related to the topic that I want to teach. In the case of warm-up, not always related. That's the main difference. The warm-up does not necessarily have to be related to the content of the task or to the objective of the task. Okay? It is basically related to one objective. What is the objective of a warm-up? Break the ice. Period. Okay? Get students into the mood of the class, but not necessarily into the learning mode. Okay? And a warm-up does not contextualize, a pre-task does. It provides input for performing the task. Remember that we watched a video this morning? This guy this morning was a perfect example for this presentation. Okay? We watched a video, we saw a video. Okay? And we didn't even know if it was going to be related to the things that we were going to develop, but it definitely was. Okay? So input is given, students are prepared for the main task, it models the language. So for example, if we are planning a dinner out, and that's the task, to plan a dinner with a person you like, okay? And you want to do the pre-task for that task, what is a good idea? To watch a video, to listen to a conversation of people planning, Okay, native speakers or not, but people that, uh, who manage the language. Uh, to do that, you set the mood, you set the environment. Okay, that's what we use with, that's what we do with pre-tasks. Okay, we can use posters, videos, pictures, demonstrations, magazines, books, clothing, anything that comes to your mind, depending on the topic and depending on the task that you want students to perform. Okay? And what about the main task? We have said many things about the main task. What about the main task? In this period, what do students do? They plan, perform, and report. Okay? They plan, perform, and report. They plan the way that they are going to perform their activity. They perform it, uh, their task, I'm sorry. They perform it, they accomplish it, and after that, they socialize. And that's the stage that we call report. Okay? They socialize. Remember that a characteristic of TBL is interacting. So, that's what we do here. And in the post task, we have feedback, reflection, and analysis. This is the stage in which we go further. It is not until this point that we make students aware and reflect of the things that they have already learned, just as the presenter, presenter this morning did with us. Remember that at the end he's, he's, he told us, and you learned the timeline, and you learned about historical events, and you know this, 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 and this, okay? In the post-task, you check for specific language, you provide more tools, okay, not necessarily or not definitely a list of words, because otherwise you would just be doing something totally opposite to the purpose, okay? Subsequent practice of language items that emerged from the, from the task, but the practice needs to be based on the TBL too. So it is not that you're going to use the TBL in the classroom and then the assignments and homeworks are going to be drills. Don't do that, okay? You encourage attention to form in this stage, in the post-task. Attention, not focus. Okay? Attention, not focus. That's totally different. Okay? And then the evaluation and the feedback. This is the post-task. 
So, with the TBL, teachers need to discover creative design for TBL. Why do you think that we talk about creative design if we're just talking about TBL? We're planning tasks, setting scenarios. We need to be as creative as we can, as much, exactly. Because if you want to use a piece of clothing, or a shoe, or a telephone, or a conversation, or inviting people to the class, that requires creativity, thoughts, thinking, okay? And lots of hours of planning, and tell that to the Ministry of Education, right? Good, it requires a lot of time. It, it is time consuming and creativity and brain consuming. But the goals are best achieved with this um, approach. Teachers need to be ready to analyze and select motivating topics. Because if students are not engaged, what happens? If they are not interested, what do you usually do when you're not interested? What do you do if you're not interested? You stand up and leave. And sometimes you don't do it just because of education and for formality and politeness. Probably what you're doing right now. Okay? Good. Then what else? Create classes. It's not a recipe. That is why you need to create, to innovate. Because it's not a recipe, it's not all written in the books. And you will find many books saying that they use the TBL that do not use the TBL. Or that do not apply to your audience, to your students. So you are always going to be adapting, okay? And creating. Designing relevant and meaningful tasks. Being ready to adopt a number of roles, of course. You have to be flexible, elastic. That's what I always say in the classroom and deal with emergent language and provide students with feedback. When I learned English many, 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 many years ago when I was at the university, when I made a mistake, I was, telling, I was talking to Romy this afternoon. Teachers recorded us to write down our mistakes, okay? To write them all down and tell us, hey, I can't hear you, not just because of evaluation, but to do something like this. You're awkward, you're terrible, you're ugly, your English is bad. Those qualifications were given to us, okay? In the past, do you remember that though, yes? <laughs> Don't cry. And finally, teachers need to be using innovative and authentic material. What is authentic material? Who knows what, what authentic material is? Real life things. Real things. Okay? That's authentic material. And of course, technology. But you have to be very careful. You need to take advantage of technology. But just as Jose Fabian told us this morning, uh, this afternoon, that we need, that we have do's and don'ts for using games, there are do's and don'ts for technology. So that's another presentation that you need to ask for, okay, with other people. Okay, here, that chart that you have over there and that you can have. We can ask Emilia to send it to you. All those are tools for different purposes. It's difficult. You cannot make it larger, bigger? bigger? Okay. In this chart over here, this flower, beautiful flower, each petal has different kinds of tools, technology tools, apps, okay, that you can use for different purposes. And the names that you have over there, it's music, art, design, video, okay, it's like an index for you, for technological tools, okay? But there is a must that Overbay, cited by Johansen Howen, said, technology should be utilized in such a way that it engages students and pushes them to make what? Connections again. That's a key word. With the material under study. 
to generate meaning, technology should serve as a set of tools for knowledge construction through such means as simulations, hypermedia, and problem-solving learning. And in this case, task performing. Okay? Very good. Don't forget that you can combine tools. It is not always a good idea to use just one tool. Okay? Because then your purpose is over limited. Combine tools. Remember that social media and social networks are very useful, but that you have to use them really carefully. Don't forget that. And remember that there are plenty, there's plenty of uh, tools and apps for video conferencing, and video conference, conferencing is good. Sometimes we as teachers, we say, oh no, nothing is compared with real contact, and, and, and it's probably or partially true. But video conferencing is a great tool for internationalization, for having your students uh, participate in networks, international networks, for listening to other people outside your classroom. So it's, it's, video conferencing is really helpful, not just for workshops, okay? And video generators, of course, and you know all the advantages of this. Now, we're about to finish, okay? What do I want you to do? Stand up, stretch out, and talk to your shoulder buddies. And then we're going to do a survey, and that's the end of this presentation. Okay? I want you to socialize, um, go around the room, talk to your shoulder body, and then after you talk to your shoulder body, you go around the room asking and finding different answers, of course, about how are TBL classes. Okay? How's a creative TBL class? And why do you think that it is necessary? Okay? Three minutes to do that. One, two, three. Okay, ready? Excellent. Okay, we are just about to land and say goodbye so you can go home and rest. So we're going to review. And we are going to review using your cell phones again. Take out your cell phones, please.
okay? Get into the link again, and please answer all the questions that you have over there. Zero nine two zero. Were you able to get into the platform? No? Esta, esta sí era la. Okay, we couldn't get in. Again, we tried this before the presentation and it worked perfectly, but we're going to do the questions. We're going to take the survey all together, okay? Okay, it says, a good proposal for a schema activation task is Can you, Are you able to read? Oh my god, this is even worse. Writing a paragraph. Okay, a good proposal for a schema activation task is writing a paragraph, watching a video, filling out a worksheet with grammar exercises, or playing a hot potato game. Which is the best one? Everybody agrees? Watching a video? Okay. Bye. No. Murphy's Law. Next. Exactly. The pre-task Tasks intend to activate previous knowledge, assess, assess the student's performance, provide a wrap-up of the class, or prepare the students for the main task. Excellent. Let's go to the next one. Would you <laughs> During the pre-task, the teacher lets the students work on their own, support and give feedback, provides general explanations, great students' work. Uh, students work on their own. In the free class? Who do you want to
The main task is to confirm students developed the com competence addressed, review linguistic aspects, prepare students for the post task, diagnose students' knowledge. Again, we're not used to having a microphone, right? Diagnostics is characteristic of the pre-task. However, during the main task, the teacher, when going around, is still diagnosing, okay? Very good, let's continue. If students make mistakes when they are producing, what do you have to do as teachers? Don't look at the answers. You tell me the answers. If when, when the students are performing the task, they make mistakes, they commit errors, what do you have to do? Take notes. <laughs> no. If you want to take your own notes just for you without being, being noticed, okay, so that they don't get nervous, yes. No, never. Never. Never, and we, always, we are always tempted to do that. But don't correct your students right away. Never. Exactly, very good. No, not even with a specific purpose. You don't correct the students when they are performing the task. The best thing you can do is just take notes, as Jose Vallan said. <laughs> but you take your notes without being noticed. I mean, because if they are doing the task and you go like this, you intimidate the students and then the communication purpose is killed, vaporized. Okay? Very good. So. The, the only thing that you should never do is correct the students when they are performing. But when we learned, or since we learned that way, it is very difficult for us teachers, right, though, yes, not to correct them? <laughs> when they say something wrong, when they mispronounce something, we are feeling all the time tempted to correct them, okay? Avoid that. And I believe this is the last, I don't remember, it was six, yes, this is the last. What happens in the post-task? Don't read the answers. Tell me. Excellent. You, besides um, evaluating, you make recommendations. Um, you give feedback to the student or a student as a group. I guess. And going further. Okay, that's our phrase today. You start from their knowledge in order to get them go further. Okay? It's been a real pleasure sharing with you all day long, getting to know some of you that I had not had the chance to, to meet. So, before, um, I'm really glad that all of you made the effort 
of coming to the seminar. Uh, all our professors devoted deeply to organizing it for all of you. So thank you very much and keep in touch. We would also like to uh, thank Ms. Pereira for her contribution to this seminar with a small gift. So for the closure of this seminar, um, we would like to give some announcements before you go home before we all go home. <laughs> um, first of all, the organizing committee announces that once your certificates are ready, you will receive an email from the major's account and a message will be posted uh, in our Facebook uh, page. Okay, so just pay attention to that. Okay, for those participants who are coming from uh, areas out of the GAM, okay, we are gonna send the certificates to your uh, university centers so you don't have to come back again, okay? Um, and what else? Yes, tomorrow we have two, uh, two webinars. Do you remember? I have the uh, topics over here and the hours. Let me see. We have one Sunday. Uh-huh, one it's about the 21st century skills. It's going to start at 9, and it will finish at 10.20. And the other one is how to provide effective feedback. It is going to start at 11, and it will finish at 12.20. Remember that you have to participate in both webinars so that you can receive uh, the certificate. Okay? Yes. Okay. Okay, and uh, just one more thing. Um, we would like you, please, just to leave your badge as you walk out the room, okay? And now it's raffle time, okay, people? So pay attention. Yes? Tobias is going to be my model. Monica is going to be as well. All the three of you, wonderful. <laughs> How many do we have? How many uh, presents do we have? Okay, when it's uh, when the box is uh, empty. Okay, so let me see. Walner Gutierrez. Walner. The next one is Heriberto Monge. Jocelyn Maria Chavarria. Okay, here we go. Diego Cordero. Okay, good. Fabiola Alfaro. Alexandra Castro. Maria Paula Molina. Not, <laughs> sorry, Maria Paula. <laughs> Adriana Marín. Andrea Soto. It's not Lasso. No, sorry. Gabriela Rodriguez. Okay. Raquel Córdoba. One more. That should be a double prize. <laughs> it is, all right. <laughs> and Susie Bautista. Uh -huh. 
Okay. Okay. So just one final clarification. Okay. Um, whenever you participate in UNED's uh, workshops, okay, we have two types of documents. Okay. One is a certificate. So if you practice, I'm sorry, if you participate in all the activities we organized, you are going to receive the certificate. If not for any personal reasons or you had to work and you couldn't make it, uh, for instance, uh, yesterday or you have some problems tomorrow, you are also going to receive a document uh, from our uh, major, but this one is going to be a constancia, okay? So, but you are all going to get that uh, legal document, okay? So thank you so much, guys, for coming today. It, it was a pleasure for us. If you want to receive the certificate, yes. Uh -huh.